A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 4 Saqqara and Memphis, Part 2. The house, a slight one story building on a space of rocky platform, looks down upon a sandy hollow which now presents much the same appearance that it must have presented when Mariette was first reminded of the fortunate passage in Strabo. One or two heads of sphinxes peep up here and there in a ghastly way above the sand and mark the line of the great avenue. The upper half of a boy riding on a peacock, apparently of rude execution, is also visible. The rest is already as completely overwhelmed as if it had never been uncovered. One can scarcely believe that only twenty years ago the whole place was entirely cleared at so vast an expenditure of time and labor. The work, as I have already mentioned, took four years to complete. This avenue alone was six hundred feet in length and bordered by an army of sphinxes, one hundred and forty-one of which were found in situ. As the excavation neared the end of the avenue, the causeway, which followed a gradual descent between massive walls, lay seventy feet below the surface. The labor was immense, and the difficulties were innumerable. The ground had to be contested inch by inch. In certain places, says Mariette, the sand was fluid, so to speak, and baffled us like water continually driven back and seeking to regain its level. If, however, the toil was great, so also was the reward. A main avenue terminated by a semicircular platform around which stood statues of famous Greek philosophers and poets, a second avenue at right angles to the first, the remains of the great temple of the Serapium, three smaller temples and three distinct groups of Aphis catacombs were brought to light. A descending passage opening from a chamber in the great temple led to the catacombs, vast labyrinths of vaults and passages hewn out of the solid rock on which the temples were built. These three groups of excavations represent three epochs of Egyptian history. The first and most ancient series consists of isolated vaults dating from the 18th to 22nd dynasty, that is to say, from about B.C. 1703 to B.C. 980. The second group, which dates from the reign of Sheshank I, the 22nd dynasty, B.C. 980, to that of Tirhaka, the last king of the 25th dynasty, is more systematically planned and consists of one long tunnel bordered on each side by a row of funereal chambers. The third belongs to the Greek period, beginning with Semeticus I, the 26th dynasty, B.C. 665, and ending with the latest Ptolemies. Of these, the first are again choked with sand, the second are considered unsafe, and the third only is accessible to travelers. After a short but toilsome walk, and some delay outside a prison-like door at the bottom of a steep descent, we are admitted by the guardian, a gaunt old Arab with a lantern in his hand. It was not an inviting-looking place within. The outer daylight fell upon a rough step or two, beyond which all was dark. We went in. A hot, heavy atmosphere met us on the threshold. The door fell to with a dull clang, the echoes of which went wandering away as if into the central recesses of the earth. The Arab chattered and gesticulated. He was telling us that we were now in the great vestibule, and that it measured ever so many feet in this and that direction, but we could see nothing, neither the vaulted roof overhead, nor the walls on any side, nor even the ground beneath our feet. It was like the darkness of infinite space. A lighted candle was then given to each person, and the Arab led the way. He went dreadfully fast, and it seemed at every step as if one were on the brink of some frightful chasm. Gradually, however, our eyes became accustomed to the gloom, and we found that we had passed out of the vestibule into the first great corridor. All was vague, mysterious, shadowy. A dim perspective loomed out of the darkness. 
the lights twinkled and flitted like wandering sparks of stars. The Arab held his lantern to the walls here and there, and showed us some votive tablets inscribed with records of pious visits paid by devout Egyptians to the sacred tombs. Of these they found five hundred when the catacombs were first opened, but Mariette sent nearly all to the Louvre. A few steps farther, and we came to the tombs, a succession of great vaulted chambers hewn out at irregular distances along both sides of the central corridor, and sunk some six or eight feet below the surface. In the middle of each chamber stood an enormous sarcophagus of polished granite. The Arab, flitting on ahead like a black ghost, paused a moment before each cavernous opening, flashed the light of his lantern on the sarcophagus, and sped away again, leaving us to follow as we could. So we went on, going every moment deeper into the solid rock, and farther from the open air and the sunshine. Thinking it would be cold underground, we had brought warm wraps in plenty, but the heat, on the contrary, was intense, and the atmosphere stifling. We had not calculated on the dryness of the place, nor had we remembered that ordinary mines and tunnels are cold because they are damp. But here, for incalculable ages, for thousands of years, probably before the Nile had even cut its path through the rocks of Silsilis, a cloudless African sun had been pouring its daily floods of light and heat upon the dewless desert overhead. The place might well be unendurable. It was like a great oven stored with the slowly accumulated heat of cycles so remote and so many that the earliest periods of Egyptian history seem, when compared with them, to belong to yesterday. Having gone on thus for a distance of nearly two hundred yards, we came to a chamber containing the first hieroglyphed sarcophagus we had yet seen, all the rest being polished but plain. Here the Arab paused, and finding access provided by means of a flight of wooden steps, we peeped inside by the help of a ladder, and examined the hieroglyphs with which it is covered. Enormous as they look from above, one can form no idea of the bulk of these huge monolithic cases except from the level on which they stand. The sarcophagus, which dates from the reign of Amasis of the 26th dynasty, measured 14 feet in length by 11 in height, and consisted of a single block of highly wrought black granite. Four persons might sit in it round a small card table and play a rubber comfortably. From this point the corridor branches off for another two hundred yards or so, leading always to more chambers and more sarcophagi, of which last there are altogether twenty-four. Three only are inscribed. None measures less than from thirteen to fourteen feet in length, and all are empty. The lids in every instance have been pushed back a little way, and some are fractured, but the spoilers have been unable wholly to remove them. According to Mariette, the place was pillaged by the early Christians, who, besides carrying off whatever they could find in the way of gold and jewels, seemed to have destroyed the mummies of the bulls and razed the great temple nearly to the ground. Fortunately, however, they either overlooked or left as worthless some hundreds of exquisite bronzes and the five hundred votive tables before mentioned which, as they record not only the name and rank of the visitor, but also, with few exceptions, the name and year of the reigning pharaoh, afford invaluable historical data, and are likely to do more than any previously discovered documents toward clearing up disputed points of Egyptian chronology. It is a curious fact that one out of the three inscribed sarcophagi should bear the oval of Cambyses. That Cambyses, of whom it is related that, Having desired the priest of Memphis to bring before him the god Apis, he drew his dagger in a transport of rage and contempt, and stabbed the animal in the thigh. According to Plutarch, he slew the beast and cast out its body to the dogs. According to Herodotus, Apis lay some time pining in the temple, but at last died of his wound, and the priests buried him secretly. But according to one of those previous Serapium tablets, the wounded bull did not die till the fourth year of the reign of Darius. So wonderfully does modern discovery correct and illustrate tradition. And now comes the sequel to this ancient story in the shape of an anecdote related by Monsieur Abou, who tells how Mariette, 
being recalled suddenly to Paris some months after the opening of the Serapium, found himself without the means of carrying away all his newly excavated antiquities, and so buried fourteen cases in the desert there to await his return. One of these cases contained an apis mummy which had escaped discovery by the early Christians, and this mummy was that of the identical apis stabbed by Cambyses. That the creature had actually survived his wound was proved by the condition of one of the thigh bones, which showed unmistakable signs of both injury and healing. Nor does the story end here. Mariette being gone, and having taken with him all that was most portable among his treasures, there came to Memphis one whom Monsieur Abou indicates as a young and august stranger traveling in Egypt for his pleasure. The Arabs, tempted perhaps by a princely bakshis, revealed the secret of the hidden cases, whereupon the archduke swept off the whole fourteen, dispatched them to Alexandria, and immediately shipped them for Trieste. Quant à coupable, says Monsieur Abou, who professes to have had the story directly from Mariette, il a fini si tragiquement dans un autre hémisphère que tout bien passé, je renonce à publier son nom. But through so transparent a disguise, it is not difficult to identify the unfortunate hero of this curious anecdote. The sarcophagus in which the apis was found remains in the vaults of the Serapium, but we did not see it. Having come more than two hundred yards already, and being by this time well nigh suffocated, we did not care to put two hundred yards more between ourselves and the light of day. So we turned back at the half distance, having, however, first burned a pan of magnesium powder, which flared up wildly for a few seconds, lit the huge gallery and all its cavernous recesses and the wondering faces of the Arabs, and then went out with a plunge, leaving the darkness denser than before. From hence, across a farther space of stand, we went in all the blaze of noon to the tomb of one T, a priest and commoner of the fifth dynasty, who married with a lady named Neferhoteps, the granddaughter of a pharaoh, and here built himself a magnificent tomb in the desert. Of the façade of this tomb, which must originally have looked like a little temple, only two large pillars remain. Next comes a square courtyard surrounded by a roofless colonnade, from one corner of which a covered passage leads to two chambers. In the center of the courtyard yawns an open pit some twenty-five feet in depth with a shattered sarcophagus just visible in the gloom of the vault below. All here is limestone, walls, pillars, pavements, even the excavated debris with which the pit had been filled in when the vault was closed forever. The quality of this limestone is close and fine like marble, and so white that, although the walls and columns of the courtyard are covered with sculptures of most exquisite execution, and of the greatest interest, the reflected light is so intolerable that we find it impossible to examine them with the interest they deserve. In the passage, however, where there is shade, and in the large chamber where it is so dark that we can see only by the help of lighted candles, we find a succession of bas-reliefs so numerous and so closely packed that it would take half a day to see them properly. Ranged in horizontal parallel lines about a foot and a half in depth, these extraordinary pictures, row upon row, cover every inch of wall space from floor to ceiling. The relief is singularly low. I should doubt if it anywhere exceeds a quarter of an inch. The surface, which is covered with a thin film of very fine cement, has a low quality and polish like ivory. The figures measure an average height of about twelve inches, and all are colored. Here, as in an open book, we have the bibliography of T. His whole life, his pleasures, his business, his domestic relations, are brought before us with just that faithful simplicity which makes the charm of Montaigne and Pepys. A child might read the pictured chronicles which illuminate these walls, and take as keen a pleasure in them as the wisest of archaeologists. T. was a wealthy man, and his wealth was of the agricultural sort. He owned flocks and herds and vassals in plenty. He kept many kinds of birds and beasts, geese, ducks, pigeons, cranes, oxen, goats, asses, antelopes, and gazelles. 
He was fond of fishing and fowling, and used sometimes to go after crocodiles and hippopotamuses, which came down as low as Memphis in his time. He was a kind husband, too, and a good father, and loved to share his pleasures with his family. Here we see him sitting in state with his wife and children, while professional singers and dancers perform before them. Yonder they walk out together and look on while farm servants are at work, and watch the coming in of the boats that bring home the produce of tea's more distant lands. Here the geese are being driven home, the cows are crossing a ford, the oxen are ploughing, the sower is scattering his seed, the reaper plies his sickle, the oxen tread the grain, the corn is stored in the granary. There are evidently no independent tradesfolk in these early days of the world. T has his own artificers on his own estate, and all his goods and chattels are homemade. Here the carpenters are fashioning new furniture for the house. The shipwrights are busy on new boats. The potters mold pots. The metal workers smelt ingots of red gold. It is plain to see that T lived like a king within his own boundaries. He makes an imposing figure, too, in all these scenes, and being represented about eight times as large as his servants, sits and stands like a giant among pygmies. His wife, we must not forget that she was of the blood royal, is as big as himself, and the children are depicted about half the size of their parents. Curiously enough, Egyptian art never outgrew this early naivete. The great man remained a big man to the last days of the Ptolemies, and the fella was always a dwarf. End of section 11